Thank you very much for welcoming me to Scott Polar Research Institute, where I intend over the next 20 minutes or so to unwrap some of the messages that are in the current IPCC report, which was released in summary in September this year and will be released in its totality um, in January or February. I'm not quite sure what the date's going to be on that. I'm here to represent ice to sea which is in a European framework program uh, that's been working to supply information to the IPCC report and to the wider debate about sea level rise now for four years. And three of us have put this talk together, myself, Tony Payne from Bristol University and uh, Jonathan Gregory from uh, the Hadley Centre, the Met Office Hadley Centre. The three of us were involved in ice to sea but we were also authors in the IPCC report uh, and so we present this jointly. As a prelude I need to remind you of the science behind ice, sea level change and the contributors to sea level change. Sea level is a complicated issue. There is no single factor that we need to work on. We need to remember that sea level change is contributed by various processes that are, some that are related to sea uh, climate change and some that aren't. On a global scale, there is thermal expansion of the oceans, which is arises due to climate change and atmospheric warming absorbed into the ocean, causing the ocean water to expand. There's the loss of ice from the glaciers and ice sheets around the world, which contribute directly to a a mass change of the oceans. Um, and then there are some more local processes. There are the dynamic changes in the ocean, which uh, due to the changes in ocean circulation, some of those are related to changes in temperature in the ocean and others are related to the salinity uh, of the ocean, fresh water being injected in new, part, new places, for instance. And then, at a very local level, there are even more changes that are associated with vertical movements in the land surface. Some of these are long-term changes, uh, continuations of uh, the response to ice loss at the end of the last glacial maximum, 20,000 years ago, or even local changes, recent responses to current rates of ice loss, or groundwater extraction on land, um, various other things that cause vertical changes in the map, in the earth. Then finally we have an issue that's not related to climate change but is related to anthropogenic impacts and that's the changes in storage of fresh water on the lands, e on the land either in reservoirs which contributes to sea level fall or extraction of groundwater which ends up eventually going back into the oceans, which is a sea, le sea level rise. If we're going to project, if we're going to understand future sea level change, we need to understand actually each of those factors. None of them are insignificant, none of them completely outweigh the others. So we need to build up individual projections of how each of those have changed. I'm going to take this in three parts. The end of the last IPCC report, the AR4 that was released in 2007, a bit of progress in the knowledge up to the present, then a summary of what's in the AR5 which is just released. And then we'll have a quick look at what we might do in the future. So the AR4 which was released in 2007 contained projections of sea level rise, but in a sense the authors of that report were very brave, they, they noted that these were incomplete. There were some factors primarily associated with dynamic changes in the ice sheets which may, meant they, they felt that those entire projections were not complete. They were stated this several times through the report in slightly different ways but essentially this uh, position arose from the fact that there were, being, there were observations of the ice sheets being made at that time which were surprising. Glaciers in Greenland were changing very rapidly, accelerating, apparently in response to ocean temperature changes. 
although that wasn't known at the time. Um, in Antarctica, we saw glaciers in, in one part of Antarctica changing quite rapidly. And those really confused the glaciologists on the writing team for this AR4 because they thought that the ice sheet should respond over very long time scales. And these were essentially very surprisingly rapid changes in the ice sheets. And so the IPCC report and the projections were essentially incomplete when they were published. Um, just to remind you of where we were in 2007, these are two diagrams that I've taken from that report, and they show really the best assessments that people had in those days of where ice was being lost from the Antarctic and the Greenland ice sheets. Essentially, it's a very speckled picture. It's rather a coarse picture. It was taken over a quite a short period, um, and it showed that there were potentially a couple of areas in each ice sheet where ice was being lost. Um, that area on the bottom left corner of Antarctica, the Amundsen Sea embayment, um, was apparently losing ice. Didn't know whether it was due to snowfall or uh, a real imbalance in the ice sheet. And in Greenland, Jakobshavn on the west coast was the biggest area of loss in Greenland. But that's, that was the state of knowledge. So at the end, as the AR4 was published in 2007, with these apparently incomplete projections, people didn't quite know what to do. There was, the science isn't there to fully incorporate the ice sheets, was the, was the understanding. And several approaches were developed by several different researchers working around the world to try and fill in that number, those numbers and produce an upper bound on sea level projections. Most of the projections we're looking, and we will be looking at, are out to 2100. So I won't remind you that the scale runs up to 2100. So you can see on this graph, you can see the continuation of the long-term change in sea level, uh, that green line, which would give us about 30 centimetres of sea level rise by 2100 compared to 2000. The IPCC's upper, ass upper assessment um, or the highest range they dared put a number on was about 58 centimetres. And then several approaches produced numbers that were higher than that. And this was in the wake of that AR4. Um, we have an approach that I was involved with, the Delta Commission in the Netherlands, who uh, are responsible for the sea level, sea defences in the Netherlands, asked for projections, high-end projections. So we put some numbers together that were basically based on plausibility arguments, back-of-the-envelope arguments. How much ice could you get out of the ice sheets? Vermeer and Ramsdorf and various other people used what they called semi-empirical models to project sea level change. Those semi-empirical models were essentially correlations of global temperature and global sea level over various different timescales. Um, but without any real physics in the models. And those produce some pretty high numbers. Tad Pfeffer finally produced some more plausibility arguments. Again, how fast can you get the ice sheets to get rid of their ice? And that produced numbers. As you can see, that so those semi-empirical models and the plausibility arguments produce numbers that are even up at the, above one and a half metres close to two metres of sea level rise by 2100. So what was, what's been done since the AR, AR4 and what's newly available since for the AR5? Just a couple of bits of work here. Firstly, we are measuring sea level now very well, very precisely, and with a complete global coverage using satellite altimeters. That record now is, uh, is almost two decades long and shows highly variable sea level change across the globe. Some real areas in the Pacific that are associated with uh, ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation, of high sea level rise, and then similar in the Eastern Pacific on um, giving us low, lower than average sea level rise. Similarly, we're measuring ice sheets with much more precision. This is 
a satellite laser product um, that shows us with great definition which glaciers are losing ice. I should note that the scale on this one is completely inverted compared to the other diagram that I showed you before. Here, red is loss, blue is gain, um, which seems natural to me. But Similarly, in Greenland, Jakobshaven and some more glaciers down the east coast show a degree of ice loss um, that has fluctuated, actually, within the period. So we have a very good understanding of the geographical pattern of ice loss and a different satellite technology, gravity satellite GRACE, shows us season by season, actually month by month, the change in the mass of the ice contained in the ice sheets, both Greenland and Antarctica. In Greenland, you can see a lovely seasonal signal that occurs because you get winter <coughs> snowfall balanced in the summer by melting ice loss. That pattern's not clear in, in Antarctica because you don't have that summer melt to, uh, to give you that strong seasonal cycle. But month by month, we can actually see how the mass of the ice is changing. And that's the kind of measurement that has been incorporated now into the IPCC's fifth assessment report. As I said earlier, the summary for the policymakers, which is the line by line agreed documents that we've been through with all the governments who've signed up to accepting this report, um, is already published. The thousand page uh, full report will be published early in the next year. In the summary for policymakers, there are actually statements about sea level in various places through the document. In the big report, there are statements in chapter four, which is the observations of the cryosphere, which is the chapter that I was involved in writing. There's chapter 10, detection and attribution. You might not, if you just do a quick skim, expect to see statements in that chapter, but it's worth going to them. Chapter 13 on sea level, well, that's where it really gets down and dirty, and that's where the projections are. So what I propose to do is go through some of these elements, and this is really taken from the summary for policymakers, and discuss each of the statements and kind of unwrap it. What does it really mean? Where did it come from? So some of the first area that we have statements about sea level change is in the cryosphere section, and we have various statements there. Now, in each case, I've highlighted the code words for IPCC in blue. If you see something in blue, then it means something more than it sounds. So very likely is a statement that refers to the range that comes after it. In this case, the range is the ice loss from Greenland being between minus 6 and minus 74 gigatons per year over that, over that period, 1992, 2001. Very likely means that the, there is an assessed uncertainty of that range and very likely means 90%, better than 90%. So it's better than 90% certainty that the value lies somewhere in that range. For Antarctica, we only said likely. Likely means 60% certainty. Sorry, 66% certainty. One standard deviation. So there, that range has a lower certainty attached to it. Um, and then for glaciers, we have contributions there. Now, in each case, these assessments of the ice loss are assessments that come from multiple papers, not just a single study, but actually looking across the range of studies that have all tried to do similar, broadly similar things. It's easier to understand like that. This is a diagram which isn't in the summary for policy makers, but is down in the chapter. So I've put the source for it for the diagram there. And in each case, you can see how we've assessed the progression of cumulative sea level contribution coming from glaciers, Greenland and Antarctica since the early 90s. Obviously, there's a, a widening um, uh, range of uncertainty represented by the funnel. 
This is one of the diagrams that appears, and this shows what I've already tried to tell you, that the, uh, the various elements that contribute to our uncertainty about, in this case, the loss of, green, of ice from Greenland, are, have all been improved. In the top, we know more about the snowfall rate, the accumulation that comes from the uh, regional climate models. We know more about the rate of ice flow. That's a middle top, comes from the velocity measurements using INSAR radar uh, uh, measurements from satellites. We know more about the actual imbalance. That's coming from, um, uh, from the laser altimetry record. And then we know more about the time-changing ice loss signal that comes from the gravity measurements. Overall, we've got the numbers there on the left-hand side. For Antarctica, same numbers, slightly more complex pattern, or same, uh, same elements of the figure, but the slightly more complex pattern. Um, in Antarctica, there still is not complete agreement between the different techniques, satellite techniques, that are used to assess ice loss. It's better than it was, but there is not total agreement there. In summary, um, we now know a lot more about the contributions. I'll talk about how they add up in a, in a little while. But we've also measured, as I showed, sea level rise, global rates of sea level rise, with considerably more pre precision. This is a mixed record. We use up to the beginning of the satellite era, which is the early 1990s, um, a, a record that's derived from the global population of satellite, uh, sorry, of tide gauges that are physical gauges next to the coastline, very few in the open ocean, which have measured tide for a long period of time and with it sea level change. So we have a mixed record, but the authors of this chapter, the sea level chapter, were actually quite confident. Again, a highlighted word there, the high confidence. In this case, high confidence means that that statement is supported by multiple different sources of data that broadly all agree with one another um, in magnitude and pattern. Medium confidence would, would have meant that there were probably multiple sources of data, but they didn't really agree very well with one another. Or it might have meant there was actually pretty much only one source of data, and we were putting heavy reliance on, on that, and therefore it could only say we had medium confidence. Low confidence, statement that's rarely seen in the report, but does appear in places, means that there are data sets that really disagree with one another, or they're derived from you know, a long string of assumptions. So, if I show you again uh, di that in a diagrammatic form, you can see the, ma the main statement there that there has been an acceleration of sea level rise in the final period for which we have satellites. And that that's... Um, a relatively high rate compared to the mean over the, uh, the last century. So we're talking about three millimetres of sea level rise, a little more than that per year. Obviously, it's not a lot if you think of it in one year, but it adds up. And there is little evidence in the past that there are rapid changes, rapid fluctuations in the rate of sea level rise on a global scale. Locally, locally there are um, changes, but on a global scale, it's a fairly constant pattern. Now, here's one of the interesting diagrams, which is actually a substantial leap forward in our understanding of sea level change. Until recently, we'd never been able to close the budget on sea level change, and what I've seen several talks give, this is the amount from glaciers and ice caps, this is the amount from thermal expansion, this is a small amount from groundwater change and reservoirs. This is an amount from Greenland. We don't really know about Antarctica, so let's just assume the rest came out of Antarctica. For the first time, we actually have measurements of each of those that have sufficient precision now to add up to approximately the global sea level rise. 
doesn't overlap perfectly, but you see in this these lower two bars that they overlap certainly within the uncertainty of all the measurements, the, addi the addition of all the measurements. And this is actually a really big step forward. I mean, I think we were on actually on a slightly sticky wicket to say we were building projections of sea level rise if we couldn't even account for current rates of sea level rise. So in scientific terms, I think this is one of the biggest um, step forwards that's expressed in the AR4. Detection and attribution, I said I'd mention a little bit on this. Um, this is, again, is another one of the major steps forward since AR4. It's an emerging science that some of you may have been involved with or come across of really being able to attribute the changes that we see on the planet in the physical systems back to an original cause. An is it or is it not an anthropogenic in origin impact, um, change? And that's done through a, a modelling approach, driving models with natural forcings and then seeing how often by chance those produce the impacts. Then driving the models with the natural forces, forcings and the anthropogenic forcings and seeing how often they can approach. And that way you can actually build up model dependent but, mod but nonetheless quantitative assessment of the likelihood that a current change has an anthropogenic or a natural cause. And I think this is one of the most interesting chapters in the AR5 um, and is certainly worth looking at. The statement that they produce is, it is very likely that there is substantial contribution, uh, anthropogenic contribution, to global mean sea level since the 1970s. Very likely, greater than 90% confidence in that statement. Um, and again, this is based on a high confidence in the anthropogenic influence of the two largest contributors, which are thermal expansion of the oceans and the ice loss from mountain glaciers. Um, future global and regional sea level rise. Um, confidence in the projections of global mean sea level has increased since the AR4. Um, because of the improved physical models, uh, physical understanding of the components of sea level rise, the improved agreement in process-based models. So this is what I was. This is the hole in the AR4: the lack of processed physics-based models that would allow them to project, in a complete sense, the projection of the sea level rise. This is actually what I, I used to see. Our task was to do was to make sure that there were process-based models that could be used in AR5. So I stuck our logo on that. It isn't entirely from ice to sea, and I would be wrong if I hadn't also mentioned programs like Sea Rise that have been running in the United States, which are actually of comparable uh, significance there. I'm going to talk about projections in a second. Um, for the AR4, you need to understand the different carbon emission scenarios that have been used in AR4, AR5 compared to AR4. In AR4, we used a set of what were uh, called CMIP scenarios, um, or SRO scenarios, and they were um, replaced for AR5 by these RCP scenarios, radiative concentration pathways scenarios. They're calculated in a slightly different way. There is a broad comparability between the middle range RCP scenarios and the middle range uh, uh, SRS scenarios, but there are some differences. I, I think we can just forget about the comparison for the moment and just say RCP 2.6 is a scenario in which emissions of carbon dioxide are constrained very rapidly. In fact, more rapidly than any government is currently suggesting that they can do. So that's the hopeful scenario. The scenario 4.5 and 6.0 are actually comparable to the A1B scenario and represent a future that's a little less optimistic. But in each case, through the middle of the century, the emissions are uh, flattened out. 
8.5 is the slightly pessimistic scenario where we keep on burning CO2 and CO2 in the atmosphere reaches five times pre-industrial by the end of 2100. So that's the burn it and uh, worry about it tomorrow scenario. So for in each of those scenarios, there's been a lot of projections built up um, of atmospheric temperature change. And these are the summary. These are the, the 2.6, the, uh, the optimistic one, and 8.5, the pessimistic one, shown as curves through the 21st century. Um, you can actually see all of the scenarios as mean changes over the last... Uh, uh, is it one decade or two decades? I think it's two decades shown in the boxes on the right-hand side. You can see that for the pessimistic scenario, we're essentially looking at um, global temperature change, mid-range estimate above four degrees centigrade. It's a big number. For the low scenario, it's actually best estimate one degree centigrade. So substantial difference. How does that impact sea level? Well, of course, there aren't such big differences because sea level rise that we're experiencing in the moment is, is to some extent inherited from recent decades of climate change. Thermal expansion of the oceans is inherited from recent decades of, of atmospheric warming. The ice sheets are responding, you know, not instantly to changes and might take you know, decades to, to even begin to show the, uh, their responses. Glaciers, mountain glaciers, take decades to re-equilibrate to new climates. So it's not surprising that the, these projections of sea level change actually do overlap. Let me, again, I think it's much easier to see it graphically. And again, here I've shown the low projection, or I haven't shown it, Authors have shown the low projection, the 2.6, and the upper 8.5. There is even some overlap there in those uncertainty bounds. It's not to say that we won't have any of impact on future sea level rise by the emissions that we make from now and onwards. And in fact, if we went round this out to 21st, uh, beyond the 2100, we would actually see substantial deviation between those two curves, divergence between those two curves. But for the period up to 2100, there is already a large amount of sea level rise that's committed in the system. If we look at the range of this now, we can see that the low range projection around that 30 centimetre mark is essentially uh, a continuation of current rates of sea level rise. As, as I said before, 33.5 millimetres per year. The upper range for the high emission scenario is substantially higher. And they're saying that the process-based models produce a likely range, 66% uncertainty, of, that it could go up to 95, 98 centimetres by 2100. Again, if we look at the sources of the sea level rise in the projections, this is not accounting, as we've shown you before, but the projections, then the same factors are still the dominant ones. Thermal expansion of the oceans and uh, loss of ice from mountain glaciers are still uh, producing big, substantial contributions. The ice sheets in this are both, uh, are both giving contributions as well. I'll show you that same type of diagram of where the contributions come from. I coloured it, shaded it differently so that I would remind you that the first one I showed you was observations and this one is results of models. So they're not directly comparable in the same way. But again, you know, each of the contributions is actually important. None of them are substantially dominating. We need to assess each of them separately. Um, now here's the complication. It's easy up to this point, but here's the complication. The authors are still not convinced that the models that they have of ice sheet change are complete enough to say that they provide 
a fully bounded assessment of the potential for ice loss. They say that, and I'm going to read this bit because it's important, based on current understanding, only the collapse of the marine sectors of the, the Antarctic ice sheet, if initiated, could cause global mean sea level rise above the likely ranges, those are the ranges that I've already shown you, um, during the 21st century. However, there is medium confidence that this additional contribution would not exceed several tenths of a metre of sea level rise during the 21st century. <sighs> there is so much wrapped up in that, and there's so many hours of argument that have been wrapped up into this, com this discussion. The process-based models are not sufficient to understand whether there is instabilities in marine sections of the ice sheets in Antarctica that could kick off, either be kicked off by climate change or just kick off because there's currently a retreat going on. And there is no certainty about how much extra contribution to sea level rise that could provide if it were to begin. There is actually rather little evidence that what we're seeing at the moment in West Antarctica, and you could see on those graphs, is the beginning of that kind of positive feedback that would produce a big range of sea, rate of sea level rise. But the authors of, the, of that chapter were not confident to say it could not happen. However, they only had medium confidence that, and so, you know, what does that mean? It means different models show different things. We have no clear picture across the models. That this additional contribution would not cause, would not exceed several tenths of a metre of sea level rise during the 21st century. Now, I, for one, many others, tried to get them to say what they meant by several tenths of a metre. And they fell back to say the published literature does not tell us what several tenths means. It's not 10 centimetres. It's probably not 60 centimetres. It's somewhere in that range. So this extra uncertainty, this extra caveat, this extra contribution to sea level rise really needs to be potentially added to the range that was given in those clear projections. So if we take the top end of that worst scenario as being 98 centimetres, then you add several tenths on top of that. This debate about whether this is a sufficiently useful statement will go on undoubtedly until the next IPCC assessment comes forward. But it, it, it is a problem, and it, it's going to be a problem, certainly for policymakers, certainly for uh, people involved in sea defence planning. Um, but the authors have been stressed by it. They have been stressed by lots of different people, and that's as, this is as far as they believe they can go with this statement. And uh, so they, I think we should support them in that uh, uh, in that much. Just to look at exactly where we're talking about, um, the West Antarctic ice sheet contains a large amount of ice that's resting on rock below sea level. I'm sure this is not news to any of you. Um, we have a better assessment of that since the AR4, um, but essentially the issue is the same. The region is the same. The concern is that the region that's resting on rock below sea level is actually the area that's changing most rapidly. Now, if we go back to the semi-empirical models and the plausibility arguments that were used, as I said, in the wake of AR4, then the sea level chapter did make some statements about this. And I think that this statement is now saying those semi-empirical models were a good approach. In the absence of processed physics-based models, that's all we had, and they were a reason reasonably good, scientifically valid approach. But once we have physics-based models, then actually those should be the gold standard. So they said many semi-empirical model projections of global mean sea level rise are higher than the process-based model projections, up to about twice as large. But there's no consensus in the scientific community about their reliability. 
and thus there is low confidence in their projection. As I said, this is one of the few low confidence statements in the entire um, report. It's there for a very good reason. So finally, let's go to some uh, talk about regional sea level rise. We saw in the map that our measurements of sea level rise show it's not a global average where it all just goes up. And that's not expected to change in the 21st century. There will be regional differences. But as sea level rises globally, then more areas see rise rather than fall. And the statement is now that by the end of the 21st century, it's very likely, 90%, that sea level rise will be seen along 95% of the ocean area and 70% of the ocean, uh, world's coastlines. So the few areas that are seeing sea level fall at the moment will shrink and diminish. There won't be that many. And if we look at maps of how that changes, you can see that those coastlines that don't experience sea level rise <coughs> are, in many cases in the polar regions, the least inhabited places. Uh, in part, they're in areas where the, there is vertical motion, upward vertical motion of the land surface, or around Greenland and Antarctica, because the ice is being lost and the gravitational attraction of that ice body is being lost, the sea level is naturally going to fall around the Antarctic and the Greenland continent where they are losing mass. So you can see a signal around the Antarctic Peninsula, one around Greenland. Um, so where next? Just a couple of minutes on this, really no more. I see, and this is now an entirely personal view, I see the sea level issue kind of diverging into two directions from, from here on. There's a issues surrounding global sea level rise and issues surrounding regional and local sea level rise. Looking at the second column first, actually it's because it's slightly easier to understand, you know, the key parameter for our coastal defence planning, our adaptation planning, is the rate of sea level rise over the 21st century and beyond, but the rate. For the global pattern, the big issue is the commitment, the total commitment to long-term sea level rise that might continue for decades, centuries, actually undoubtedly centuries. Um, the way that that feeds into the debate about what we should do to climate change is quite different. For regional and local, you know, it's an adaptation issue. How do we change the sea defences um, in our highly populated coastal cities? And in the global debate, it's how do we mitigate, how do we reduce the overall impacts of climate change and the committed sea level rise into the long term? So they kind of see the debate going in, uh, the uh, the issue kind of going in two directions from here on. Let's just talk about one example. It's one that several of you, I'm sure, will have heard me talk about in the past. Um, but it's about sea defence in London. London's sea defence, the Thames Barrier is there. This is the 100th closure. It's protecting London, which is sitting behind the barrier quite nicely. It was built on the basis of the statistics of sea level, sea level and extreme storm surge that we've built up through historical records and, uh, and also modelling. And that shows this kind of distribution. So, you know, we've got return period along the bottom from one year on the extreme left to 10,000 years on the extreme right. There's actually not that much difference in the maximum storm surge height between those. It's only two metres. So if we actually change base sea level in this area, the level of protection that's currently afforded by the Thames Barrier of once in a thousand years will change. Add a metre of sea level rise to that, and that level of protection goes from once in a thousand years down to about once in ten years. So there's actually a big difference between those. Once in a thousand years, probably entirely acceptable to people living in London. Once in ten years, clearly not. 
once in a hundred years is probably still not acceptable. That's saying we expect one flood breach of the sea defences every hundred years, what, every lifetime, if you like. That's not acceptable. So, you know, the Thames barrier is managed by the Environment Agency and they, they understand this very well. They're looking into the future, thinking, well, how long will it take us to build a replacement for the Thames barrier? If we do, how high do we have to build it? If it's two metres, it's going to cost more. If it's one metre, it's going to cost less, um, be easier to build. We need to know how high we're going to have to build it before we start building. And then it should last for, a, you know, well, certainly 80, 90 years. So we don't want to start building it too early. So we need projections. We need to wait until we really are confident in the projections and that we know the difference between whether it's going to be a metre or half a metre. That's actually a very rational approach that they're taking. So that's really what I wanted to say. And, um, well, 20 minutes went completely out the window, didn't it? Um, but there is more information on the web, there's more information about ice to sea and there's more information about the IPCC. The totality of the chapters will be out in a published form uh, early next year. And I think I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you.